All righty, let's get going. I apologize for the technology challenges. I hope you've been able to join us on Zoom. My name is Paul Gross, and I am the founder and chair of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. And welcome to the MyCP webinar series that we're kicking off tonight with a small glitch in technology. Uh, so we're really hoping to do a series of community-focused presentations about the research we do in the network. Uh, the agenda tonight is to give you a quick overview of CPRN and MyCP, and then turn over the microphone to Mary Gennati, who is, uh, Dr. Gennati is a professor at uh, University of Hartford and has been leading the effort to conduct our research into the uh, adult population with cerebral palsy. So she'll be talking about the preliminary findings of, her, of the work that she and a number of people have worked on about adult health and well-being, and then we'll do a Q&A. Um, so the mission of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network is to improve outcomes that people with cerebral palsy value most. And that's very important. And for those of you that participated in Research CP, we have set our research agenda to be what are the problems that you want to see us addressing through research, um, high quality clinical research, and quality initiatives. Uh, so what is CPRN? It's a little bit uh, conceptually um, interesting. It is a collaboration, basically. It's not an entity. It's a collaboration of institutions, of clinicians, therapists, researchers, and patient advocates that are very interested in seeing outcomes improve and by uh, advancing research. There is a physical entity, which is the data coordinating center, which is where all of our data comes to. It is based at the University of Utah, and hence that University of Utah logo there in the Population Health Sciences Department. We have two major pieces of infrastructure that support our research. One is a clinical registry, and that is used to characterize the patients, and I say patients, June Kales, who's on, always says, you know, we're, you know, we're people, not patients, but the clinical registry characterizes the people that come into the hospital. Um, Dr. Gennady is gonna be talking about the community registry where we're just uh, talking to people in the community. So it characterizes patients, the interventions they receive, and the outcomes. And our data collection is uh, quite unique because it's built into the electronic medical record. The second piece of infrastructure is the community registry, and that is something that's connected to my cerebral palsy, and I'll talk about that. And that's what allows us to follow both children and adults long-term to understand the outcomes of all of these patient characteristics and interventions. MyCP is a web portal. It's a place you can go to. Many of you on the call are part of MyCP. It's owned and operated by the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. And it's really for the extended uh, CP community. So it has not only uh, people with CP, caregivers, advocates, but it also has clinicians, researchers uh, there as well. And they're there to advance research. The portal offers participation in our community registry uh, where studies in the form of surveys are available. It, it enables discussions about research, research priorities, and your experiences living with cerebral palsy, and it offers news specifically about the research that CPRN is uh, doing. And then we've been building out a set of tools that are intended to enhance uh, the interactions between clinicians and uh, people with CP. And so that's a new area that we're investing in. And I'll encourage you all to go and sign up if you're not uh, signed up already to be part of my CP. So those are the two pieces and how they fit together. Um, we are very focused on accelerating research. So this is just a quick glance at our research pipeline. Concepts come in through the left-hand side and they get developed by, a team, by an investigator or a team of investigators. They get approved by the network to pursue funding. Um, if they get funding, they, get, uh, they move through a process of ethics approval, the construction of the study, and then they're executed, we gather data, we publish the results, and then we take the learning from that and we feed it back into the clinical care process. And uh, that's one of the unique things we can do. So that makes us what's called a learning health network. Um, so I'm not gonna go into any of, of these in any detail, although right in the center there, you see the adult pro registry. 
uh, and Dr. Gennady is going to be uh, talking about the results of the preliminary work being done there. But lots of ideas being developed. Many are approved. Many are in um, are, are in execution, and we're starting to publish. So the network itself is spread out all across North America. Um, the green spots are places that are already collecting data. Uh, the yellow are, are in what I call the the um, the phase of implementing the technology. The red are in what I call the drudgery phase of getting through all the compliance uh, and the ethics approvals. And the blue, the blue ones are uh, sites that are um, wanting to come on board. Although if Deb Gabler were on the call, she'd want me to say that this blue dot over Chicago for the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab is now a uh, is now a red dot. They are now in, actually they're a yellow dot. They're now working on their IT side. So lots of places. Uh, okay, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mary Gennady. Um, Mary, it's going to take me a moment to figure out um, how to unmute you um, and I, mute myself. I unmuted myself. Oh, you unmuted yourself. You're very powerful. Look at that. Um, go for it, Mary. Yes. Uh, you have the ball. <laughs> All right. Thank you, um, everyone, for listening. And I hope I'm not preaching to the choir. Um, I hope I'm preaching to some consumers or at least sharing information with them. So I have the great honor of being the co-chair of the adult work group and presenting this information. Next slide, Paul. So I'll talk about the importance of proving lifespan care. Um, a little bit about childhood activities and research, the urgency to provide treatment options and clinical insights into functional changes, pain, and overall issues with health. And then we'll look at the survey findings and you know, see how we can make um, everyone's voice count, the people that we work with and the consumers that are taking these services. Next slide. So <clears throat> as you know, we know there's about 17 million individuals in the world with cerebral palsy. So each icon is representative of 1 million people. Next slide. So the people in green are the children and those in yellow are adults. Most of the folks in the world who have CP are over the age of 18. Next slide. But <clears throat> the research and clinical practice focuses on childhood. And you know that makes sense, it's a time of high plasticity. And this bias is cross-cutting to research priorities, which have recently been changed, but only recently did lifespan health become a priority. Government funding agencies, hospital administrations, clinical practice, policy and programs really work on supporting um, to some extent families with children with CP and there's not a lot happening in adulthood. Next slide. And you know what do we offer adults with CP? For a long time we said it was a static condition that didn't really change and people fought really hard to be you know overcome their disability and integrate into society and feel like you know they had overcome it. But with growing awareness with the baby boomers, we, we know that this is not true. And there's a lot more questions. Next slide. So some people, my colleague Lisa in particular, thought she knew everything there was to know about lifespan care with adult with CP and then had the surprise of cervical stenosis in her 60s where she greatly affected her function or quality of life. And, you know, I agree with her that this is unacceptable. Um, we need to do better than this. Next slide. Research is just coming out, <clears throat> mostly through health services research, that adults with CP have poor health and they're at greater risk for all types of secondary conditions, cardiovascular diseases, psychoses, arthritis, osteoporosis, arpenia, and they're less likely to use health services. Next slide. Well, this is 2020. This is the time to shape your future. And if you're gonna fill out the US Census, I would really like for you to 
encourage people that you know with cerebral palsy, consumers, clinicians alike to, next slide, please, you know, shape your future. Let's fill out these adult CP surveys in 2020 and get some information about what is going on with this huge segment of the population that we only have a little bit of information about. We need more insight into how to prevent the, these issues and how to treat issues. Next slide. So this is the face page from ICP. Um, if Paul didn't show it, I'm gonna show it. And where you can join, whether you're a clinician or a, re uh, a researcher or a individual with CP and, to, and be involved in forums or take surveys. Next slide. <clears throat> So we created a battery of adult surveys, and the goal was really to provide information um, about health and well-being for individuals to share with clinicians. And as Paul said, we're working on a face sheet, um, and that's in progress for people to get a score sheet when they, when they fill out the surveys to share with their clinicians. But it's also a way to gather a large, amount of information from a large population really quickly. Getting patient reported information is a lot more cost effective and quick than applying for huge multi-center grants and for registries that may or may not be funded. Next slide. So what the surveys ask about are basic information, just about age, education, and work, how CP affects individuals' abilities, changes in the ability to move your hands or communicate, your overall health and well being, if you think people treat you differently because you have CP, and if you have chronic pain. And for those who have chronic pain, we have more in depth questions, and they follow the recommended guidelines from the International Pain Association on patient reported outcomes for people with chronic pain. Next slide, please. So who developed these surveys were a lot of clinicians and researchers that work with adults with CP, along with adults with several palsy who were connected through the CPRN network or through the clinics. Next slide, please. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes a lot of these surveys are um, computer adapted, so they, they will make the questions go as quickly as possible, depending on how you answer them. But it might take a little bit longer if you need physical assistance to type any of your comments, or if you have lots of comments, because we do have open space for comments. Next slide. So far, and we submitted this for a presentation um, at the next several policy meeting, we've had primarily females participate. We had 123 people that we um, gathered their responses from. They were mostly white and mostly working. And they were split between, you know, young adulthood and older, old adult, older adulthood. 18 to 44 years or 45 to 65 years of age. But we did have a few people over the age of 65 answer. And we also had a variety of severity for communication abilities, um, abilities for fine motor skills and gross motor skills. So we had a, a wide variety of physical abilities. Next slide, please. Now, when we wanted to evaluate overall health, well-being, and stigma, we used measures from the National Institutes of Health, and these are normed according to population standards. So if you get a 50, that's the mean. Anything above the 50 means you have more of that characteristic. Anything below 50 means you have less of that characteristic. Okay, and 10 is the standard deviation where it's really, that means that's a very um, 
large amount of difference if there's 10 points. So we would suspect that physical function would be at 38 because these are people with several palsy and it affects their physical function, correct? But the other things to note is satisf satisfaction with, with participation was below the mean. And then we look at fatigue and anxiety and they're much, uh, they're above the mean. Depression is slightly and pain is 10 points above. And neuro, the NeuroQL stigma measures how much stigma you think people have against you. And you can see that it's overall above the mean. Now we have a range of scores where some people might have really low or really high characteristics. And we don't have a large enough sample to see how that plays out with your physical disability type and other issues you might have. But that's why we need more people. Next slide. When we ask people if they had a change in their best gross motor function since childhood, 67% said yes. And of that 67%, 90% had a decline. The interesting folks are the 10% that improved. And it's going to be nice to get more information about the surgeries and exercises that folks did to improve their gross motor skills. Next slide. Reasons for gross motor decline or improvement, and you can see that the top three reasons are really talking about gross motor decline, are pain, change in strength or increasing weakness, or change in spasticity or dystonia. And now we know from my friend Lisa's surprise of cervical stenosis, where her spine squeezed her spinal cord and made her um, very weak and somewhat paralyzed. The changes in strength can be either neurological or muscular, and this requires more investigation and research. And changes in spasticity or dystonia. Why is this happening? Why is this happening in a static disease? and pain, certainly this is a call for physical therapists to take action. Next slide. Change in the last three years in ability to use hands as reported by adults with CP show that <clears throat> we had 32% that reported a decline, uh, reported a change, and 82% reported a decline. Again, is of interest, are the group that improved in adulthood? And was it TMS? Was it constraint induced? What did they do to improve their hand function? This requires more investigation. Next slide. When we asked people about communication, it was a smaller amount. It was 17% who um, had a change and it was 64% that had a decline. Now, some of this improvements are related to technology as well as therapy. And again, this requires some important dissemination amongst um, or invest further investigation as communication is a huge barrier to participation. Next slide. And then when we asked overall, do people have chronic pain, yes or no, in our sample, 81% said yes. It, there was a, it's, it's just an overwhelming amount. Um, but again, this is not a population sample. So, but this is in line with what's reported. Next slide, please. When we looked at change in pain over the last year, uh, over the last year for adults with several palsy, overall as a group, 48%, that's the dark blue, sorry, the slide is blurry, got worse. And when we broke them up by age cohorts, you can see that the most, uh, you have a larger report, 51% of young adults report a increase in pain, whereas 45%
in the 45 to 65 group. So again, how can we leverage this information to treat pain in young adulthood when people are really working hard and support them when they have high participation in society? Next slide. When we ask people um, where was their most painful um, body part and what was painful, the most painful is in red. It's the hip and the back. But all, you can see that hips and backs and legs and knees are also frequently reported as painful if they're not the most painful. So again, activities to support and prepare people for adulthood and the pain they might experience in their lower extremities is warranted. Next slide. Here are some of the therapies that worked. Be fun to investigate some more of the exercises and really see how we can flesh out what people said really worked um, and, and disseminate that information. The key issues with this information is this is just a great beginning. We need hundreds of more responses to get the information we need to help prevent and treat functional changes in pain in adulthood. But I think this is a really great tool and a way to leverage um, patient voices to get that information. So get involved. Forget about the census. Let's do an adult CP survey 2020 census on functional changes in well being and get some targeted research questions for prevention and treatment. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, let me just make a few more comments before we um, open it up to QA. Uh, so, this is the first um, presentation of the webinar series. And Mary, I think you're going to need to mute so we don't get a little, um, hearing a little feedback. Um, so um, we are going to, this one was specifically focused on adults. Um, the other topics are going to range as to whether or not they're about adults or about children uh, and whatnot. Um, but we're going to get a report from the CPRN registry overall, which is probably about 20%, 20-25% uh, adults. Um, we're going to get a great report on the uh, co-occurrence of epilepsy in uh, CP, and it's really just the start of uh, tremendous research that we think we're going to be able to do. Um, we've got a lot of work going on in the network about uh, spasticity management, since um, spasticity is, I think, the uh, diagnosis for about 80% of the people with CP. Uh, so management techniques are, are key and we're looking, um, we're dividing the group into um, diplegics and uh, people that are, are not ambulatory and looking at the different management, um, both medical management and uh, surgical management and there's a fair amount of change going on there. So we're going to be talking um, a bit about research that we've concluded, which is the practice variation study but then looking at some of the studies we're hoping to conduct um, that we've submitted grants for, for the ones for July and August. Um, September, we'll have Dr. Michael Kruer talking about his CP genetics study, which is uh, looking at uh, uh, sources of CP from genetics that are, were previously thought as unknown. And so um, that's research involving uh, both parents and uh, the person with CP. Uh, and then we have a, a new investigator that we funded as part of the um, request for applications that we did with uh, CP Now. That's uh, we're going to launch that study in the registry in the next month, and it's about the effect of speech on participation. So that'll come later because we think we'll have preliminary data, if not complete data, uh, closer to the end of the year. Uh, and then there's another study that's launching shortly uh, by Dr. Ravamuthan uh, that is going to be surveying on attitudes towards uh, different aspects of diagnosis for CP and how people feel about those. 
So we've got a lot lined up. Um, we hope you've enjoyed uh, tonight. I'm not, I'm not wrapping, I'm just wrapping my questions. We are gonna open it to uh, Q and A. And then I wanted to reemphasize what uh, Mary said at the end there, which is if you haven't joined MyCP, I would really encourage you to. It allows you to contribute from the comfort of your home and at your, your computer to contribute to research that will help advance care. Um, as you can see from the study, the adult study, if we can fill in more, round out the number of participants in that, we're gonna have great data that's gonna drive additional research, but also just make a great case for the importance uh, of research into these you know, different areas we're learning about uh, through the uh, our, our adult census, as, as Mary referred to it. Um, you also optionally can be contacted for uh, clinical trials as, as those uh, come online. So it's a way to know about research, uh, more significant research that's happening. Um, we have a set of tools that we're building that I mentioned. There is a first tool that's there, which is just helping people know their GMFCS or their gross motor function classification scale number. And um, uh, Mary, did you participate with, with Amy and uh, Michelle on that research that demonstrated that there's a very large percentage of people that don't know their GMFCS or their child's GMFCS? Yes, so we actually, um, we, we were under, wanted to know if parents or individuals knew their GMFCS level because a lot of the research, their gross motor functional classification level, you know, can you walk? Do you walk a little slow? Do you need crutches? Can you use a wheelchair? Do you have to use a wheelchair? And um, because we use it to guide research and treatment, we use it to, to make up goals for physical therapy. It guides what we need to do. And so what, what we found out when we surveyed 300 people that most parents didn't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that so that's our first tool. We went from asking you questions and knowing what your GMFCS level was, actually providing a guide that that took you through, helped you determine the GMFCS level, and then gave you a resource to help you understand why that why that level is important and what some of its ramifications are. Um, anyway, there's also a forum that allows us to. Uh, allows you to discuss uh, research priorities. There are a number of clinicians that are there or get called in to answer questions. So Dr. Gennady's on, on there, uh, Dr. Hurwitz, Dr. Noritz. Um, there are some researchers that are doing technology. So it's a, just a great forum. It's growing uh, in discussions and, and potential. And so I would recommend that you join, uh, join MyCP. So with that, I want to open it to questions. I see there might be some questions in uh, chat. Um, and so I'm going to take a look at that. But in the meantime, you're, you're all muted. And you should have the ability to unmute yourself, as I discovered with uh, Mary. If you want to ask a question, what I'm going to suggest you do is unmute 